Hi, this is Pinchas. The video you're about to watch is a lecture I gave to a group of undergraduate students at a Christian university, but don't worry, you will not doze off. I'm about to begin exploring the notable prophets before the era of kings and kingdoms, and as I start with Moses, I take some time to answer a question one of my students asked about the four-letter name of God and how it was pronounced. So if you're curious, keep watching. So to kind of remind you, the prophets are divided a little bit differently in the Hebrew Bible as they are in the Christian Bible. Basically, we have the two categories, the Rishonim and the Acharnim, the uh, former prophets and the latter prophets. And the former prophets are people like Joshua, okay, the books of Kings and Samuel and Judges and all, all of these books that are essentially are considered to be historical books. Uh, in the Christian canon, they're actually considered to be former prophets, or in Hebrew, you could say first prophets, to translate it literally, or early prophets. They're, they're prophets that come on early in history, and then there's prophets that come later in history. So the prophets that come later in history are the prophets when uh, of the era of the kings, and particularly of the era when the kingdoms are divided. This is where most of the prophets that we read that have their own books in the Bible fall into that category. Okay, you have the Isaiah, you have Jeremiah, you have all the 12 prophets in there. And so uh, most of those, the ones that we're familiar ones, are called the latter prophets, but some are the former. So uh, slightly different division between major, minor prophets, the way Christians talk about them, and, you know, former or latter prophets, how Jews talk about them. But hopefully, as I go through this study right now of the prophets before the era of kings, it will make sense to you why, in Jewish tradition, the prophets really are identified as prophets way earlier, way before um, the era of kings. So that's what we're talking about. So I'm still going through this uh, book, okay, Hebrew Prophets in a Social World uh, by Victor Matthews. Uh, it's an excellent book. Um, the Prophets Before the Era of the Kings, Premonarchial Prophets, okay, chapter three. Uh, that's where I'm going to pick up. We do have quite a few prophets that come on the scene in the Bible uh, that predate uh, Saul and David. Saul is the first king of Israel, right? And so we're talking about prophets before the era of the kings. The first examples, the first easy primary examples that come to mind uh, is Moses and Balaam. Moses uh, is definitely a prophet, uh, but Moses is a bit unusual. Moses is much more than a prophet. Let's put it that way. He's not just your typical prophet who speaks for God, who, you know, gives oracles or predicts things, who has confrontations with kings. He is so much more. Uh, Moses is unique because his leadership uh, among the people of Israel is really all-encompassing. Okay? Moses for example, serves as a judge. Uh, and then as he does that, he can also present public offerings. He can also officiate ceremonies at the tent of meeting in the wilderness as a priest would. So he fulfills the function of a judge, and then he also fulfills the functions of a priest. In fact, he's the one who consecrates Aaron and all the priests in, uh, of Israel. So at the same time, Moses gives people revelation about God. Uh, he expresses God's will to people very directly, basically speaks on behalf of God all the time, which is what prophets a lot of times do. But then he also performs many amazing miracles. So Moses is really an unusual figure. He is a prophet, but he's so much more than a prophet. And, and so a lot of the other prophets throughout uh, the scriptures will be compared to Moses in some way, shape, or form.
In fact, Moses is a gigantic figure uh, in the Bible that just many people will be looking to him or someone like him to manifest themselves uh, in a similar way. But then there are things in the life of Moses that are very similar to other prophets. As many other prophets in the ancient world and uh, in the Bible, Moses has a story that's associated with him, which we call a call narrative. Uh, many prophets have this similar type of a story. So we've already read the call narrative from Isaiah, for example. Okay, when Isaiah is being called and he says, I'm not worthy, and God cleanses his lips, the angel comes and puts a coal to his lips, and then and then uh, there's this interaction between Isaiah and God. He sees God, vision of God, and then he's finally commissioned. So there is this moment in Isaiah's life when he comes to God face to face. He has this amazing experience with God. And in that moment, he is sent to become a prophet. And so we call this the call narrative. We've already seen this. And so Moses also has a call narrative. So the call narrative, Moses sees a burning bush. He approaches it. And when he does, he realizes it's not just a bush. Is God. And at that moment, God calls out to him specifically. And God tells him that he wants him to go to Egypt and to deliver his people. Now, if that's not a call, then I don't know what a call is. But in this case, he says, go back and deliver his people. Now, what does Moses do? Moses says, oh, no, I can't do it. Right? He says, I can't even speak well. So he gives God an excuse. Remember, a lot of times in the call narrative, there's an experience of God, you know, very supernatural, very face to face. God tells him, God tells the prophet, I want you to do this for me. And the prophet usually says, oh, no, I can't. So you see, in Isaiah's case, he says, I'm not worthy. I'm a man of unclean lips. I come from the people of unclean lips. So what does God do? God changes that. He he fixes it. He makes a remedy, right? He cleanses him. So same thing with Moses. Moses says, I can't speak. So he says, don't worry. I'll bring Aaron to speak for you. You see, his excuse is nullified. God says, don't worry. I'll take care of it. I still want you to come and be my prophet who's going to lead people out of Egypt. So that's the moment of Moses' call, the burning bush, okay? And then also there's this empowerment. So just like Isaiah received special empowerment by having his lips cleansed, and now we can imagine that his lips will say God's words, right? Because he's been supernaturally prepared to speak for God. In the same way, Moses is supernaturally prepared to speak for God because then there's that moment where he says, well, what is your name? Like, who should I say sent me, right? So God tells him his name. So now that he can go to Israelites and speak in the name of this particular God, and then he says, well, how? what if they don't believe me? Then he gives them a miracle working power, right? He says, "You, I will make miracles through you, and they will believe you. But what if what if Pharaoh doesn't listen? So don't worry, I will display my power, my signs. So every time Moses comes up with some kind of excuse, God has an answer. He has a plan. He already has what to do. And so he gives Moses supernatural power. Okay, and He actually illustrates it to him by having his hand turn white and then turn normal. So you see that there is a, a symbol of God's power is present at the moment of this call narrative. So Moses has a call narrative that is very, very powerful. In fact, it is during this call narrative that we get the name of God. Okay? So a lot of times uh, people um, sort of say, focus on this idea of God's name. In fact, both of the textbooks, you know, that we're looking at um, are using God's name and they call the name 
Yahweh, right? So you've read this. You've read this in your main textbook. The author talks about God being named Yahweh. And so did uh, Matthews. Matthews keeps using the name Yahweh. I don't know if you notice or not. I don't use that name. <laughs> so, and there's reasons why. Uh, because essentially it is a name that was made up by scholars in the 20th and 21st century. It did not really exist prior to that. I guess I'm more traditional and I simply do not uh, use God's name. That's how I grew up. That's how I was raised. Um, out of respect, I just call him God or I call him Lord. But his personal name uh, is not possible to know because it's not spelled out in Hebrew. Uh, when you read Hebrew uh, in the original text, in the ancient scrolls, there are no vowels. So all you have is four consonants. You have Hebrew letter Yod, Hebrew letter He, Hebrew letter Vav, and another Hebrew letter He. All those are consonants, no vowels. And so nobody really knows what vowels go in between those consonants. The scholars have extrapolated the uh, vowels that they believe go in between those consonants. And that's how they come up with the name Yahweh. Okay, but they don't know. They actually are guessing, essentially. And it's an educated guess, but it's still a guess. So um, when God revealed his name to Moses, the record that we have does not have vowels. It only has consonants. And so the only way we can know these things is by tradition. And tradition has been not to pronounce God's name uh, so that not to dishonor it, essentially. Anyway, there are different perspectives on, on God's name. So if you ever wonder why I'm not using the name Yahweh as I teach uh, and I lecture, I guess I'm a bit more traditional in that sense that uh, try to be respectful by not trying to use a name which I'm not even sure is a real name. It's kind of a made up name. Let's put it that way. For thousands of years, Christians called God's name Jehovah until the scholars later came up with, oh, that's not how it's pronounced. That's pronounced Yahweh. But Christians used the name Jehovah. And the reason why Christians use the name Jehovah is because in the, uh, eventually the Hebrew scribes invented vowel markings. You see, Hebrew language is a consonantal language. It has consonants which are part of the alphabet. The alphabet is made of only consonants. And vowels exist, but vowels are not part of the alphabet. Vowels only implied. You can read Hebrew without vowels all the time. In fact, if you were to travel to Israel and you see a road sign or a billboard, it's not going to be written with vowels. It's going to be written in consonants only. And because you know the context, you will be able to understand what those words are. You can read English without vowels too, by the way. Essentially what happened is when the scribes came up um, with the vowel markings, they made them up. Uh, and they made them up anywhere probably around 5th century, maybe 8th century of the Common Era. So we're talking about there's no vowels in Hebrew till about year 500 or maybe 800 of the Common Era. So imagine that. 500 years after Jesus, the scribes come up with some squigglies to represent A-E-I-O-U. Okay, that's what they did. And the re there's a reason why they did that is because many people are forgetting how to pronounce the text correctly. So what they did is they placed the vowel markings above and below the original letters. And when they did that, they took the vowels from Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord, and they placed those vowels over uh, the name of God. Okay, the four-letter name of God, yod heh vav -Heh. So they actually took vowels from one word and placed them into another word. And the reason, the reason why they did that is because every time people come to God's name, they do need to say something, right? They, they can't just leave it out. 
So they said, we're going to put a mnemonic device. We're going to put a little code in there. And the code is this. When you see this word, say this word. So they put the vowels from one word to and attach them to consonants from another word as a device to remind everybody that you're not supposed to pronounce the name of God. You're just supposed to substitute it with the name Lord. Okay? That's why they took the vowels from the word Lord. So when they did that, of course, Christians who read those texts later on did not know this. They didn't know this tradition. They actually thought that's how God's name was pronounced. So they pronounced God's name, taking the consonants that are original with the vowels that were fake. And that's how the name Jehovah came to be, because those vowels are from the word Adonai. Uh, when um, Christians at some point in history, well, around second century, lost their connection to Jewish culture and to Hebrew language, uh, when Jerome translated the Bible into Latin, he studied Hebrew, but he had to go way out of his way to study Hebrew because in their own community, within Christian community, there were nobody that could teach him. He had to go outside of the Christian community to learn Hebrew, basically, so that he can translate the Bible into Latin. So that tells you that basically Hebrew was a lost language for Christians for the most part. And after Latin uh, Bible came to be, nobody cared about Hebrew for a long time, probably not until the days of the Reformation, which is when Christians started to renew their commitment to Hebrew because they wanted to study the original text. And, uh, and that's when the name Jehovah really came to be because they realized that the name actually has vowels. And they pronounced it the way they read it, the way they saw it, without realizing the tradition that Jews have basically planted in that word. Uh, and so that's how that's how that whole name came to be, let's put it that way. So that became the way of pronouncing God's name for a long time until the scholars came up with this new way, saying Yahweh. Okay, Neither one are precise or arrived at, you know, with any sort of, uh evidence they're just guesses you know one the jehovah we know for a fact is fake because the the vowels are from one word and the consonants from another you know that's never going to work uh but yahweh is just a scholarly extrapolation uh which they hope to be true but we have no way of confirming that so and in jewish culture the name has not been pronounced uh audibly so there's no way to for people to know it, there were only the priests are the ones who pronounced it uh in jerusalem temple and only a, really a couple of times per year and that's it so when the temple is destroyed and the priesthood is scattered that tradition goes into complete loss and so i don't think nobody re has retained that because there would be no purpose or reason for that name to be pronounced anymore. It was only pronounced during a ceremonies at the temple. And uh, and when it was pronounced, the pronunciation of that name was drowned out by the sound of the trumpets. So even the people could not hear the name. Imagine that. As I am praying a special prayer, at the moment of me saying God's name, the trumpets blast, and nobody could hear it except God. Because God can make out his name with a noise, right? And I know what it is, but you don't get to know it. If you come and you observe the sacrifice, you still walk away not knowing the name of God. So that way, I actually accomplished both goals. I protected God's name from you, misusing it later. And at the same time, I still spoke it as God commanded for us to speak his name, you know, uh, in, uh, in prayer. So anyway, it's a complicated and long tradition when it comes to God's name. but. Uh, it's um, it's worthwhile, sort of say, <laughs> knowing about it. People are really focused and kind of zeroed in on having to pronounce God's name, but Jews have lived without it for thousands of years and it still goes on, and, and it's not a problem. So somehow we have no problem with addressing our earthly parents with a way of respect. We would never say their, their actual name. We would address them by their title mom, dad, you know, something like that. Those are their titles. But for some reason, when it comes to God, we have to say it with his personal name. We can't just be happy with calling him Lord or God. <laughs>
Like that, we got to be able to say his name. I'm like, we don't do that with our earthly parents. So why, why, why the, such a big difference? Anyway, we have a little double standard going on here is what I'm trying to say. Uh, if that works with our earthly parents, it should work with God. So that's, that's my perspective on it. Anyway, that's the easiest way I can explain it. What's been going on for thousands of years in Jewish tradition. Let's get back to Moses. Moses demonstrates his power as the prophet after he is called through the sequence of 10 plagues. You remember that story. He challenges Pharaoh uh, and he calls to let his people go. But then he proves that God is on his side through the power of the 10 plagues. If you don't let my people go, I'm going to do this. And then he does it. And then it happens exactly as Moses predicted it would happen. And then Pharaoh relents. And then Moses, he changes the plague back. He restores things the way things they were. And Pharaoh changes his mind again. And so goes on the story with the ten plagues. But as you could see with Moses, his authority as the prophet is validated right away, immediately, through a very clear demonstration of God's action. God proves that Moses is his prophet through these miracles, and he does it right away. There is no waiting period. There's no 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, 100 years. What Moses says will happen happens right away, and God's power is revealed right away. That doesn't happen with every prophet, but uh, with Moses, it's very clear. It's interesting that later on in the story, as you continue reading uh, uh, the five books of Moses, you learn that Moses delegates some of his authority to 70 elders. At some point, it becomes too difficult for Moses to handle everything. Uh, and so he gives, uh, God gives the elders uh, in the community of Israel his spirit. And people are overcome by God's power. And they prophesy right away. Immediately, it says that those 70 elders of Israel start speaking prophecies. Which is, again, a sign that they are endowed with the same type of, of gifts, the same type of power that Moses had. And now they can offer people judgment and solutions and help them with their problems just as Moses did. So Moses is a good example of a prophet before the days of the kings. Prophet before that era. Just a quick interruption. In this next segment, I'm going to consider Bilam very briefly, an unusual case, a non-Israelite who speaks for God. And then I'm going to move on to Samuel, a remarkable prophet who served as a bridge between the era of judges and the era of kings of Israel. If you enjoy this video, and I hope you do, please don't forget to subscribe so that you can be alerted when I upload more videos like this one. Keep watching. So the other prophet that I mentioned uh, that I wanted to briefly look at is Balaam. Uh, Balaam, or Bilam as he's pronounced in Hebrew, or Balaam as he's pronounced in English, uh, he is a very unusual case. He is a non-Israelite prophet. In fact, he is a seer. He's a visionary. He sees visions, and then he interprets them. Uh, he is a non-Israelite, non-Jew. This is very interesting because he appears to be speaking for God, and he appears to be a true prophet whose predictions actually come true. Now, this is a very unusual case in the Bible. Again, the prophecy and communication with one true God happens to be, sort of say, in the domain of the Hebrews. But here's a non-Hebrew, here's a non-Israelite who tends to speak for God, and it actually works. So that's pretty amazing. Now, if you remember the biblical story, uh, Balak, one of the kings that Israel is about to conquer, seeks the help of uh, Balaam because he is God's prophet, because he is intermediary, because he's a representative of God who is believed to be capable of somehow interceding uh, for good or for ill with, with God. But basically, he's looking for his help any help that he can get. Why? Because he pretty much knows he's about to be conquered. And so when uh, Balaam comes to him, he dispels his hope, the hope of this King Balak, uh, 
that he can somehow control God's message by stressing over and over repeatedly. He says that he can only speak the words that are given to him by God, and he cannot change those words. So as much as he would like to, he can't. This is the calling of the prophet. This is how we know the real prophet. Real prophet does not control the message. He can't. He gives the message, but he doesn't control it. He can only say what God says. So uh, Balaam is an interesting case. He's not a stranger to divination. Remember, he's a pagan. He's a non-Israelite. And he used divination. We talked about what divination is, determining things from physical signs, determining meaning from physical signs. So he does use divination. He does use sacrifices because he's trying to procure God's favor. And that's a very common way in the Near East to approach the divine. Once Balaam realizes that God wants to bless Israelites and there will be no cursing of any sort that's going to happen, he kind of abandons all those methods and he just goes to just trying to perceive God's will and speaking. So he, he dispenses with sacrifices and all those things later on. And so uh, as we read the story, Balaam is portrayed as somebody who is desperately trying to deliver to the king what the king asks. The king wanted for Israel to be cursed. And Bala keeps trying to find a way to bring some sort of a bad message upon Israel, but he can't because God would not allow him. No matter how hard he tries, no matter how many times he tries, every time it does not come out as a curse, it comes out as a blessing. And if you read the story in the book of Numbers, then you can remember how the king who orders this, the king who requests this, uh, Balak, he becomes very frustrated. He says, why can't you do it? Uh, why can't you just curse them? At, at each point, Balaam has to explain, I don't have that power. I can only say what God says. So in the end, uh, you know how the story goes. Hopefully you read that passage in Numbers. And, the sen uh, and basically, the words of the prophecy that he gives to the king are the words that God wants to say. But his sin is not those words are not even trying to uh, find a way to curse Israel in some creative way. Uh, the sin of Balaam is that he gives king advice how to trap Israelites. And that is the sin of idolatry. They will lose favor with God if they start worshiping foreign gods. And so uh, if you remember the story, there is a plague that starts in Israel because Israelites join themselves uh, with idolaters and basically have a big wild orgy. And, and that's what takes Israel down, essentially. So that's the sin of uh, Balaam, not really the words that he said. In the end, he gets killed uh, in the war with Midianites because he is a diviner. He is a pagan prophet. In the end, he is... Uh, uh, he practices that which God forbids clearly. Divination is forbidden in Deuteronomy, and communing with other gods and things like that is clearly not something that God approves of, so he does get killed. Uh, but um, as we read these passages, it's important to note that Balaam is still a very significant figure, very unusual figure, a non-Israelite prophet, who actually acknowledges the God of Israel and seems to recognize that he is true God and his power cannot be subverted, his power cannot be denied. And this is what we call universalism. So from time to time in the Hebrew Bible, you will see this theme of universalism, meaning that somehow non-Israelites, non-Hebrews understand that there's this one God God of Israel is a real God, while the whole time they're living in the world of many gods. Yet somehow they're able to acknowledge this one God and their power. That's what we call universalism. That will pop up from time to time in the Hebrew Bible, in some moments stronger and in other moments 
weaker, but uh, that will happen. So that's king. That's prophets before kings. Those are the two examples that come to mind right away um, that are very significant. There is another prophet um, that is sort of on the on the edge. He's he's the bridge. Okay, his name is Samuel. Uh, Samuel is another very colorful, very unusual, kind of like Moses prophet. What makes him so unusual are several characteristics. You see, prior to the days of Samuel, it was the days of Judges. And Judges uh, basically governed or ruled or provided leadership to people in some way, shape, or form. But this era of judges is characterized by significant social and religious and political chaos. Things are in disarray. There is no central government in Israel. There's no central government. There is no central authority. Uh, there's no not even centralized worship. It, people are not organized. Israelites who settled the land are kind of a fringe culture within a large social environment that is very different, very uh, unlike them. They stick out. Israelites are not like the other local populations of Canaan. And so that makes it very hard for them to survive because they're trying to organize themselves in a way that nobody else has organized before. Everybody has kings. But Israelites don't. So there's this period of judges, which is a period of political and religious chaos, really. There's no clarity of where people are supposed to move and how they're going to be led. Um, so it's uncertainty. And, and that's when the books of Samuel come. And that's where we get uh, another narrative, which reminds us of the this person that we know, Moses. Samuel starts to remind us of him a lot when we start learning about him. Um, from the very beginning of Samuel's story, uh, we have very miraculous circumstances of Samuel's birth. His birth is really unusual. Remember, his mother asks to be given a child. And when she's given the child, she promises that child to God. That there, there, The story of Samuel's birth is unusual. And then there's a story what can be compared to a call story. Remember, every prophet has a call narrative. And so does Samuel. Now, Samuel, is, his call narrative is very unusual. It's not typical. It's not like uh, Moses. It's not like Isaiah. It's not like Elijah. It's, it's completely different. Uh, remember, there's a case of mistaken identity with the old priest, Eli. He's not sure if it is Samuel speaking or God speaking. But that is the moment. That is what we call the call narrative, where it becomes very clear to us as the readers of the story that God is with Samuel and that Samuel is speaking for God because the old priest confuses uh, God and and young Samuel. At this point, he's he's young. He's 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 a child. Yet there's this mistaken identity, and it becomes clear that he's speaking for God. If his voice can be confused with the voice of God, that makes it clear for us that that there's that connection. And so later on, as we read the stories about Samuel, just like Moses led Israelites into battles, so does Samuel, leads people into battle against their enemy, and having God really as what we call the divine warrior. There's this idea that God fights for Israel, that the reason why the battle is won is because God is giving the victory. Basically, just go out and do what you normally do, fight the war you normally fight, and even if you're not so great, the enemy is still going to be defeated. Why? Because God is going to make sure of it. You do your part, God will do his part, and in the end, you will win. 
that's what we call the power of divine warrior. God is fighting on your side. So that happened with Moses. That happens with Samuel. And just like Moses, Samuel is also a judge. Remember, he stands on that period between judges and kings. Samuel essentially is the last judge. And so he acts as a judge. He hears people's complaints. He helps them resolve their problems. But then he's also acting as a priest. So you see, once again, Moses, uh, Samuel, there's so many connections between them. So Samuel's authority, by the way, seems to be very limited to a very narrow geographic area. Just like many judges before him, he has limited control. He's not over the whole land of Israel. He doesn't have the whole kingdom consolidated. He just works and ministers in one particular area. Like I said, there is no centralized government. There's no one place in Israel where leadership comes from. There's no center. And Samuel, remarkably, is still a model of authority and leadership that did not exist since the days of Joshua. If you think about it, the great leader before Samuel of that type, of that statue, is Joshua. After Joshua... There's nobody that great, nobody that powerful, nobody that strong, nobody through whom God works in such a mighty way. Maybe there are some leaders, but for a short time. But Samuel is really somebody who could be compared to Joshua or Moses. And what's interesting is that Samuel is not even a Levite, at least not by birth. Yet he performs priestly functions which suggests to us that uh, the priesthood was something that could be obtained, not necessarily genetically, but through adoption as well. Because remember, uh, his mother gives him to the temple. She gives him to the service of God. She basically allows the priest to adopt him as his own son. And so though he is not born a Levite, he's allowed to fulfill the priestly functions. So as I said, Samuel serves as the bridge between the era of judges uh, and prophets who serve now alongside of kings. He serves as the bridge between the prophets before there was a centralized power of the kingdom uh, and then who served, you know, during that age of the kings. In fact, Samuel defines what, uh, what it will be like for the prophets while the kings are on the throne. Samuel kind of sets up the pattern of what it's like to be a prophet while there is also a king. And Samuel also brings about certain unity and centralization of power uh, through his own authority, through his own ministry, but also by uh, setting up a king. And so, and, and that makes Israelites fit a little bit better into the social climate of their neighbors. Because remember, up until this point, Israelites do not have centralized government that is led by a king like everybody else around them does. They are the unusual ones. Hey, it's me again. The rest of this segment is about Samuel and his role in the establishment of the monarchy in Israel. Now, the struggle between the words of the prophets and the behavior of the kings began almost immediately. Now it's about Saul and Samuel. Though Samuel is not entirely enthusiastic about establishing a monarchy in Israel, he does announce the first king of Israel. So he obeys, you know, that's something that it's a request he takes to God. It's a request that God goes along with. And that's the request that satisfies the people, basically. It becomes one of the duties of the prophets after Samuel because Samuel provides the pattern, is to anoint kings. If you think about it, the kings in the history of Israel are anointed by prophets. And it all begins with Samuel. And it is Samuel who confers God's blessing upon uh, the reign of, of this king. And it is Samuel who is really the representative of heaven. He is the representative of God. And he confers God's blessing upon the king. 
Samuel is the one who picks the king. Well, God picks the king, but then Samuel is the one who has to follow suit and present uh, this one particular person as God's choice. And then he anoints the king. And the symbol for anointing, the oil that is being poured out on the king's head, is also a very beautiful and a vivid picture. It's a symbol. If you don't know this, the uh, oil was used in all areas of life. Uh, ancient Israelites used olive oil for cooking, uh, for food, for cosmetics, for medicine. Uh, basically, oil is everything. It's like a staple. You can't live without oil. It's it's one of the major food groups. There are three food groups that are most important to ancient people. Bread, wine, and oil. Uh, you can't live without those three things. Got to have. Uh, and so oil being that symbol of a staple, a provision from God. So anyway, that's what the prophet anoints the king with, which is also symbolic. So as we read the story of Samuel, uh, we see King Saul, who's anointed. The challenge that Saul has is to be different from those kings who surround Israel. But he doesn't know how to be different. It's not like somebody else did this before him, so he can know what to do. So Saul struggles. It's unusual because Israelite king is accountable to God and accountable to God's laws. And he also must follow the directives of God's representative. In this case, it's prophet Samuel. That does not exist in other cultures around Israel. In other cultures, uh, kings are not accountable to God. They make their own laws, and they certainly do not listen to the prophets. They may listen to the prophets to interpret some uh, oracles and to give them some symbols and some insight into the will of God, but the prophets cannot argue with the king. The prophets cannot chastise the king. They cannot put the king in their place. In other cultures, that is not happening. But in Israel, it does. And that is a whole new dynamic that's very different. Uh, so we already talked about this difference between Hebrew prophets and prophets of other uh, ancient Near Eastern um, nations. So essentially, this is this is part of this dynamic. Curiously, Saul understands uh, that Samuel is this unique person, and perhaps Saul understands it because, in one point of his life, the Spirit of God is poured out upon Saul, and it says that he danced with the prophets. And he himself prophesied as well. I don't know if you knew this about King Saul, but he did have a gift of prophecy for a short time. So it's amazing. And it kind of comes on him and then and then we don't hear about him. So it's not it's not something that stays with him, but he does receive a spirit of God and he does prophesy. And so perhaps he understands Samuel because he understands uh, what a life of a prophet is really like. This is very similar to how it happens with the 70 elders and Moses. Moses uh, gives, you know, God gives some of Moses' spirit to those 70 elders and they prophesy. And there's something similar happens with Samuel uh, and uh, Saul. But then there's a conflict, a conflict that arises between uh, the king and the prophet. And this happens in 1 Samuel chapters 13 through 15. Um, Saul basically disregards the established order of things when Samuel is delayed. Uh, when the kings would go to war, people would normally bring a sacrifice and inquire of God's favor to see if, if God is giving them victory or not. Because there's no point of fighting a war if this war is not sanctioned by God. So you're looking to make sure that God is with you. And so Saul is standing in the face of the Philistine armies, getting ready to attack. He's at Gilgal. And Saul waits uh, for Samuel to come, but Samuel is not coming. So Saul becomes impatient and 
instead of waiting for Samuel, he decides to bring the sacrifice to God himself. So he basically usurps the power, uh, the priestly function. The kings are not supposed to be priests. That is something is not allowed. A priest is a priest and a king is a king, but you cannot be a king who brings sacrifices. There's a separation of power, so to say. And there's a reason for that, because too much power gives people way too much authority and it corrupts them. So Saul takes that power onto himself. He brings a sacrifice and then Samuel comes. The impatience that King Saul shows, shows that the, he disregards God and his ways. And he demonstrates that he's willing to bend the rules and force his will when it's necessary, no matter what the rules are, because he feels like the situation that he's in is necessary to do that. He does what whatever he thinks that he needs to do. And despite of all the rules, the rules don't matter. So that shows a serious weakness in Saul's character and him disregarding the order of how things were established by God. So that's the first conflict uh, between uh, king and the prophet. Remember, we talk about how kings and prophets often have this conflict. They have this very difficult relationship. Okay, so that is when it happens. This is the first king of Israel, and this is the prophet uh, with whom he has to work together uh, in the end, they have this conflict. So the second conflict between king and prophet arises when Samuel calls on Saul to conduct what we call a holy war. Okay, in Hebrew, it's called the harem. Uh, it, the war is against Amalekites. Amalekites are the old enemies of Israel, way, 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 way back from the days of Exodus. It was in the wilderness when the children of Israel just came out of slavery that Amalek came and attacked people. And if you remember the story, Moses and the people fought them off. This is when Moses needed some help holding up, holding up his hands. Remember that story. So that's the battle with Amalek. Amalekites have become the perpetual enemies of Israelites. And God decreed for them to be completely wiped out. So Saul is instructed to destroy everyone in uh, Amalekite camp and destroy everything, destroy everything, burn everything. But basically Saul disobeys. He takes some of the spoils of war, as it would be typical. When people would go into war, a lot of times they would capture things and property that they would want to keep. They could be valuables, they could be gold, they could be jewelry, they could be cattle, they could be people, slaves. Doesn't really matter. The point is that when people would fight wars, they would capture goods. And that's what Saul does. He disobeys. Uh, God does not want any of this. Samuel doesn't want any of this. The commandment is to destroy it all. Let it be. Don't touch anything that belongs to these people. And Saul tries to justify his actions that he took these spoils so that he can make a sacrifice to God. But of course, the reason does not matter because the, regardless of the reason, he disobeyed a direct commandment from God. And that once again shows that King Saul's character is a problem. He does not obey God, and whenever he wants to change the rules, he changes the rules in the way they suit him. So his disrespect for God's laws, his disrespect for God's commandments or decrees continues to manifest itself in more ways than one. That's what the story teaches us. Basically, these two incidents, these two conflicts disqualify Saul as the king. And, and that is why we're told in the book of Samuel that uh, his royal line will not continue. The kingdom of Israel will go to another family. Saul's descendants will not be kings. And this is where the story of David comes in. Samuel is also involved in the selection of this new king, 
if you remember reading that story, he picks uh, David through a series of circumstances. Again, God guides them and God gives them instructions, but Samuel is the one who picks them and Samuel is the one who ultimately anoints him. Uh, what's different about David is unlike Saul, David later receives an assurance that his dynasty will last forever. His line will be kings in Israel forever. Why? Because God promised so. Why does God make that promise is a different story, but the fact is he does. And then Samuel, of course, anoints David. Uh, at that moment, none of this is revealed yet. Samuel never gets to see um, David ascend to the throne because Samuel dies and Saul continues living as the king of Israel. You cannot dethrone a king at that point. So his, his life has, come, has to come to a natural end. And David actually has to wait for a long time to become king. So there's one final prophetic role that Samuel played that actually occurs after his death. Uh, king Saul was completely cut off from God. If you read the story, you remember that he is in a very dark place. Uh, there are no other prophets who serve him. There's no way that King Saul can hear from God. And King Saul, in all of his disobedience, he's still desperate to hear God's will. He's afraid of the Philistines. He's afraid that his kingdom will come to an end because the Philistines will take over. So he needs to hear from God. But Prophet Samuel is gone. So King Saul breaks a, another cardinal rule. He ignores one more commandment that is really an important one. He basically goes to consult a witch, another visionary, another individual who speaks to the dead. And he's asking to summon the spirit of Samuel so that Saul can know uh, the will of God. So the length that Saul goes to are remarkable and it's amazing that samuel actually does come from afterlife and does speak to king saul uh but it doesn't work out the way the king expects it the king does not get what he wants from the prophet uh the prophet does not give him the will of god in fact the prophet tells him something that he doesn't want to hear because in the end the prophet is not God. He's not divine. He cannot be consulted through spirits or mediums. He, you can, you're not supposed to speak to the dead. He's just a human being. And, uh, and the prophet cannot change the course of events. The prophet does not control the future. Uh, he only speaks what God will do. So it's very disappointing, but this is the last thing that happens in, in Samuel. Curiously, it's not during his even lifetime. It's after he's already dead. But you could see that Saul, King Saul, is so far from God at this point. He continues to follow that pattern uh, of making bad decisions and bad choices. Uh, so that's another uh, story about a prophet who really comes as the bridge between the era of the judges and the kings. Uh, once Samuel dies, and once the new king is established, once the kingdom is now centralized, at this point on, all the new prophets, all the successive prophets will be serving alongside with the king. And in that era, when Israel is being governed, uh, not through judges, not through some military leaders or prophets, but really it will be in the hands of the king. The administrative power will be in the hands of the king, and prophets come alongside of kings to continue to reveal what God wants uh, from his people.